Hey, how's it going? Dan Schinder here on Yes Shift with... Steven Schinder. I'm the son, he's the dad, and we talk about Yes and Yes members and other related stuff. Related to Yes and Prague. And I don't know if you recognize this music, folks. Well, there's a description here in the post, so I guess it's <laughs> sort of no surprise. But this is going to be a fun episode. They're all fun for us. Hopefully fun for you. Chime in. The questions Steve and I ask each other are not planned, and they're very authentic because uh, we don't really talk about this much. And in fact, this episode, we didn't talk about it at all. He doesn't know what I think of this album we're going to talk about, or both the albums we're going to talk about, and I have no idea Steve's thoughts. So uh, this this will be fun. Um, yeah, so to preface this, uh, we're recording this uh, two days ahead of Jeff Downs' 70th birthday, so it coincided really well with this next album and our first solo album since joining Yes series. Uh, so we're talking about The Light Program, his first solo album, and uh, toward the end, we're also going to touch on Synthesizer Classics, a recent release that includes not only Jeff on a track, but also Rick Wakeman on a track and Patrick Mraz on a track. So and, and what I have to say about that album might blow your mind. Okay. Yeah. And it, it might, so one thing, both things, no, one thing will blow your mind. The other thing might get people in an uproar. Oh, boy. <laughs> which, you know, I'm good at. <laughs> Not yeah, even planning uh, I mean, it. We're, yeah, I'm, we'll get there, yeah. but um, Let's talk about this album, The Light yeah. Program. Um, I, I'll start, if you don't mind. Well, you want to give some context, right, to when this came out. We love doing that so that people kind of see what was going on in the prog scene, the music scene, around the time any album comes out that we talk about. So why don't you kind of set the stage? Right, yeah. So this is The Light Program by Jeffrey Downs. Um, it also has the new dance orchestra name on it. His first two solo albums apparently use that uh, name. But um, yeah, so we have some context here. Of So this came out in 1987. And Basically, what was going on at that time, the Moody Blues, well, the year before, um, in April, the Moody Blues released The Other Side of Life, so April 86. Emerson, Lick and Powell released their album in May of that year. Genesis released Invisible Touch in June of that year. So, you know, Invisible Touch, I get the sense, is like the owner of A Lonely Heart of Genesis. Um, correct me if I'm that's, wrong. That's fair. It's, that's in that that realm and emerson lake and powell was kind of a weird thing and it might be the last or close to the last thing cozy powell did i can't mm. remember what year he passed away i saw that concert do you, did you know that oh uh, i i don't remember if he ever told me but yeah um yeah. on halloween and not oh, only so that yeah Sorry, just real quick. Cozy died in 1998, so he may have oh, done some other stuff yeah. after that. But. Yeah, absolutely. I had that time context. But just a quick note, not only did I see that concert on Halloween, but Victoria and Samantha's mother and I, that's Steve's older sisters and my first wife, uh, we were broadsided in the rain while we were driving Samantha, I'm um, sorry, Victoria to grandma's house to um, grandpa's house to watch them while we go to the concert. Um, some, and what happened was it was earlier in the day, Samantha wasn't born yet. Marcy was pregnant with Samantha and Victoria was little and she was in a spider outfit that had multiple like legs and stuff. Oh, wow. And uh, the truck was totaled, but we were able to use uh, Grandpa's car to still go to the concert, which was at Irvine, in fact. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Just a little <laughs> weird trivia there. And there were no signs of Halloween until the Encore or Pirates when Keith Emerson put on a skeleton mask on his face. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Sorry um, for the digression there, but. Yeah, no, it's cool. But, um, yeah, so also in 1986, his uh, good friend and former bandmate, uh, Trevor Horn, um, and 
Okay, he was an executive producer on Frankie Goes to Hollywood's Liverpool, which was released in October of 1986. And um, I don't think we mentioned it on the show yet, but Trevor Horn is releasing a memoir in October, I think October 13th. It's called Adventures in Modern Recording from ABC to ZTT. It's a very clever title. So I'm getting I that. I watched, yeah. you know, a couple <laughs> of videos about the way he did stuff back then. I loved that. So I'm I'm really interested. I I think he's really a an a genius in a lot of ways, musically, but production wise and as an audiophile, I just think the name that he was given, the the man that invented the eighties music or whatever, yeah, I, it's well deserved, absolutely. And who would have ever thought, you know? Yeah. And I I'm What's that? Um, oh, sorry. I, I I was just gonna say, and I'm trying to see if he's. I'm trying to reach out and see if he's willing to be on the show. So I don't know if we'll get a response, but in any case, I think it'll be interesting at least to once we read that memoir of his to review it on an episode at some point. Call so. him out on a bunch of stuff, <laughs> like we did, Bill. Right. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and before continuing with the context, I feel like we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that uh, today also would have been Keith Moon's birthday, you know, influential drummer of The Who oh, yeah. and very influential on many musicians. Oh, yeah. Influential sure. on a generation of music, if you will. Absolutely. Um, and really kind of the archetype of drummers you know, Animal from the Muppets is modeled after Keith Moon. And just that whole stereotype that all all drummers, you know, blow up toilets with dynamite and throw TVs out the window. <laughs> and pretty much him and John Bonham did that. But yeah, he, he was a character. Um, I heard that he was one of the nicest guys. And um, a lot of people believe that his drug overdose was from you know, he, he was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict, but he actually overdosed on, I, I think it was methadone, the drug you take to prevent withdrawals when you're quitting drugs, strangely mm -hmm. enough. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but the early Who music all the way up until he passed is really magnificent because of Keith. You know, he had a, yeah. it was like Keith, I, when I interviewed, um, uh, Chad Smith, I interviewed Chad Smith when we were doing the documentary of the, the making of the Ox and the Loon that Brian Titchy did. Uh, Chad, Chad said, yeah, it's like Keith was doing a drum solo through every song with a backup band kind of playing along. And that's, that's actually a good take. For a lot of albums and songs, he didn't even have a hi-hat. So revolutionary drummer in a lot of ways, absolutely. Huge kit. You know, he went through that stage in the later years uh, with a huge kit and everything. And like Bonzo had the timpani drums and gong. Uh, some great music there. Wants me to makes me want to revisit some Who. Yeah, definitely. Some of it just stands the test of time. Um, yeah. But getting back to the context of this album, we actually got a bit of help from one of our viewers slash listeners, uh, Carl Coppage, who sent this email. So. Uh, I'll get through this uh, really quickly. So he says, 1987 was not the greatest time in the world to be a Yes fan. I can only speak for myself, but I know I was not the only Yes fan who had more or less lost touch with the band at that time in their history. As of June 1987, it had been over three and a half years since the last Yes studio album, longer even than the gap between drama and 90125. Since January 1986, there had been only four Yes-related albums released, which were uh, two of them by Wakeman, titled Country Airs and The Gospels, and Bill Bruford's Earthworks and GTR. Uh, we talked about GTR a little bit when we had Steve Hackett on the show recently. Yeah. Um, uh, but getting back to the email, uh, he continues, Asia had essentially broken up. There had been no tour for Astra, and the album had peaked on the charts at only number 67. The single Go had hit 46, despite a reasonable amount of airplay on MTV. 
The one bright light in this period of Yes and Genesis fans was the band GTR, based on a twin guitar concept with Howe and Hackett. GTR was another corporate rock band masterminded by Brian Lane. The single When the Heart Rules the Mind had hit number 14, and the album peaked at number 11. An attempt at a second GTR album was made with only Steve Howe on guitar and Jeff Downs producing, but the record company cut off financial support when the album was only two-thirds done. In 1987, both Wetton and Downs had solo albums scheduled for release by Geffen Records. Downs' aim was to synthesize a variety of cultural influences into his album, blending sound and technology in a revolutionary manner. The title Light Program paid homage to early BBC radio. Their original pop music program on BBC was called The Light Program. Things, mm. things perked up quite quickly for Yes fans a few months later when Big Generator was finally released in the fall. And a whole slew of solo albums was also released between late 87 and 88. Four albums by Wakeman, all within less than a year, as well as John's In the City of Angels and Steve's Seraphim with Paul Sutton. I have to uh, say that just that one statement alone, four albums by Wakeman all within a year. Yeah, like only his he brain could do must that. have just been <laughs> barfing out material. That's that's amazing. Yeah. There's one um, thing to come up with that much material, but to then produce it and you know, I wonder how much of it was recorded, you know, a backlog of recordings that he just threw together into four albums or what the that's a whole other side conversation we need to look into. But I love that statement. I don't know how many people realize how many questions there are in that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and he continues, for me personally, the live program is not my favorite Jeff solo album, mainly because his greatest strength has always been as a songwriter, and particularly in collaboration with other writers slash vocalists. My favorite is an album called Vox Humana, which utilizes a co-writer named Johnny Warman. However, some fans really think this album is great. I found this review on Prog Archives um, by... T. Zerme, uh, I think that's how it's pronounced. Zerme, yeah, I believe. Yeah. Um, so I won't read the review. I'll link it in the comments and in the show, in the uh, uh, description. But basically, the gist of the review that he found, uh, this, this person compared it favorably to it basically kind of saying this was like six wives of Henry VIII for this time. And it was like that important for keyboard it's type of thing if interesting and i believe it's vox humana and carl thank you information lacking notwithstanding but we're happy you were able to throw <laughs> something together on that and i'm right. kidding that that's really a nice robust take on all of that really is thank you yeah um so yeah that's a that really paints this pretty well because you know by this time jeff had done Asia quite recently and of course before then he also did drama and he did the buggles you know the very two buggles albums and um I, I do have I have listened to a little bit of uh Vox uh sorry how does it pronounce Humana Humana okay yeah I've heard bits of it and it does sound closer to Asia and GTR which I, I mean go figure it has Max Bacon singing on a song and John Payne singing on a song even uh that one came out in 92 but somehow sounds very 80s um whereas this first uh solo album is instrumental so it's like very different and it doesn't have covers like uh the second album does you know that one has covers of a couple buggle songs and uh there might have been like some other stuff as well but yeah yeah where do you want to uh, should we list the track list for the yeah. light program first? Yeah. Um, yes. The light uh, program features uh, Symphony Electronique, Oceana, Ethnic Dances, East West, Urbanology. Um, yeah. Then there's a 2007 bonus track, Shadows, which is a sample taken from the 2003 Shadows and Reflections album. Yeah. 
And each of these tracks that originally appeared on here, they're fairly long and each have their own section titles, but it would take a while for us to read yeah. all of them. But yeah, I think that illustrates how each of these go through different changes in style, which is quite impressive. So what what was your initial take when you first listened to this album? Uh, so... I remembered the first track uh, being impressed when I listened to it last year for our uh, Jeff Downs episode then, just how it re- it really sets the mood of it. Because it, it's, yeah, I think it was smart to put it as the opening track, uh, you know, a symphony electronique. It's because it, I, I didn't know what to expect really, but as it kept going, it's like, okay, this sounds very 80s um maybe there's like drum machine stuff on here possibly but then it gets a bit more intense as it keeps going and i just get kind of hyped when it does the whole you know it gets a little bit heavier it's yeah like, like built up yeah 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 um and so listening to the whole album uh, in preparation for this episode uh, it's very it's very great to listen to at night. Like it's, it's somehow, I somehow visualize it taking place in nighttime for some reason. So, you know, I'll be outside a little walk and um, it made for some great music for that. And um, I don't know if that's just this album or because much of the music from the eighties, like in my head feels like perpetual nighttime for some reason. I don't know if that's because of like some of the MTV music videos, but um, yeah, I and but I think after listening to that first track, you kind of expect the rest of it to be like that track, but the other tracks do like other styles as well. You know, Oshinia, um, I, I think that's the one where... Um, uh, there, one oh of, yeah, I said Oceania. It's Oceania. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah, w- one of these songs feels like you could have like a river dance type of thing <laughs> against yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I don't remember if that was uh, Oceania or ethnic dances. Um, I think I was surprised when a uh, one of these songs started out with like a soft fairy tale feel and then picked up the pace. I was like, oh, okay, let's go, yeah. uh, type of thing. Uh, East West, uh, as it keeps going, it goes into a part where it sounds very, it has that sitar sound, you know, it's very, uh, and it makes me think of, you know, East, uh, Asian cultures that utilize that type of thing. And, uh, and then you get to urbanology and that goes through different styles as well. And there are a couple of places where, the sound makes me think of arriving UFO. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, and, and about 11 minutes into Oceania, there's a moment where it reminded me of the song, or the track Incantation, a uh, procession from Patrick Moraz's Story of I, which has uh, uh, that sound that's like, do, I, do, 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 now do, I know do, what you mean. I wouldn't have recognized it by title name, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, listening to them back to back, they sound different enough to have their own identity. But I do wonder if maybe there's a little influence there intentionally or not. Because we know how big of a Miraz fan a Downs is, you know? Yeah. But, um, yeah, and Shadows uh, gives a nice taste of, I, I guess, what may be on that other album, Shadows and Reflections. But what was your overall take listening to this? Because well, you you didn't come across it um, back in the day, did you? Like, no, were you aware of it? I didn't know about it till you brought it up. And <laughs> what I heard was 180 degrees away from what I expected. I don't know why I even formed something in my mind, a predisposed expectation musically. For some reason, I expected it to, well, like Carl said, you know, he's so well known for his songwriting. 
I expected him to go back and revisit the Buggles sort of feel, a bit of new wave, glam mm. pop sort of. I expected that. And then I was like, what is this? This is just <laughs> not, you know, like when you go to sip some some soda and it's iced tea, your brain is like, yeah. you, you know, <laughs> that's what it did to me. Um, but I, I love it. And like one of the first questions that came to my mind is I wonder – and I don't want this to sound wrong or come off like judging because it's not. It's just a question. I wondered how much of it is sequenced and programmed versus how much is he sitting or standing at keyboards and playing while record is right. on, you know? And and I wouldn't fault him either way. I mean, if he said, yeah, I programmed the whole thing, that takes talent. You know, that's difficult to do. Um uh, but it just the curiosity was there for me. I love the sounds. My favorite tracks. This is really um, very few things I listen to where I would say it's really hard to decide a favorite track. And this is one of them. But I have to say I love East West. I love the textures that you pointed out, like the sitar. I think there's a Kyoto sound in there from Japan, the sitar from like India, Sri Lanka, you know, that whole region. Just, I love that song. Um, and it is ethnic dances. I love that as well. It's got so many different influences there. And by the way, he can river dance to Metallica if you feel like river <laughs> dancing, but I get what you mean. Um, so this really took me by surprise, and I, I listened to it straight through twice uh, to make sure I was hearing yeah, same. what I thought I heard. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. The production's great. It's very produced of the time, even though I expected the sounds to be, like I said, more like the Buggles or something like that. I didn't know if he'd be singing or what the deal, or a lot, or vocorder. You know, just that whole right. sound that encapsulated that time when they got big and then hooked on to Yes. I, I was really surprised. I think that was part of the, um, the, the pleasure for me is that, A, it was nothing like I expected, but B, that didn't ruin it. It made me like it even better, I think. Yeah, definitely one of those things where you're not sure what to expect, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like I think, you know, maybe some could consider this a detriment, but it does sound very well, a chunk of it at least does sound very ingrained in the 1980s. Like you can oh, definitely yeah. tell it's of that era, whereas there might be some of these other soul albums we've talked about where it's like, oh, yeah, you could drop that anywhere, um, with the exception of maybe. I don't know, Ramshackled sounds pretty 70s to me, but yeah. um, but I, I still like that 80s sound. So even if it's obvious like when it came out, it still sounds pretty good. So how, how do you think him being in Yes, this is a question we always ask in this miniseries. And, and comment, folks, please comment. We'll read comments right here on the show if they're live. Um, how do you think, and these are the first solo albums of each Yes member after they had joined Yes. So if they right. had three solo albums out before joining Yes, we're not covering those first. We're covering the first since Yes. Therefore, that begs the question, how do you think him being in Yes influenced this album? Yeah, I think this might be the toughest time answering that question. Because, really? you know, even with Bill, it was like, he was actively trying to do his own thing and not trying to be yes. Whereas I don't know if um, may maybe that could have been possible for Jeff as well. Like this uh, album, it sounds very different from yes. So like, I, I don't really know like how working with yes could have influenced this apart from maybe um well, I guess this will be different, but being a Yes fan and a fan of Moraz may have influenced that a little bit I mentioned earlier. But I, I don't know. Is there like some sort of answer that comes to mind for you? Yeah, absolutely. And it's the exact same answer I gave for that question for Bill Bruford's first solo album. I, I don't hear, at a lesser degree, I don't hear a lot of Yes 
him being in Yes, I think of drama, not the other Yes catalog, but I don't hear any of that influence musically of him from when he was in Yes. I think that it was an influence as far as learning how to work in the studios and mm. record and go through that process, deal with management, all of that. Other than that, I don't, I don't listen to it and go, oh, this guy must have been in Yes. Just like with Bill, you listen to that and... You know, other than his signature snare drum sound, you'd never know if you didn't know, you know? Right. And something I just thought of is what's interesting is I think the genre for this album is electronic, but the song lengths, like the composition lengths, feel very prog rock length, yeah. you know? And that's very woven into like the yes DNA, especially in the mid 70s, oh. you know? That reminds um, me, another in, uh, uh, feeling I got, there was a lot of stuff in here that sounded very motion picturesque, that mm -hmm. it were, could absolutely be some great soundtrack music. Um, and that fits in with what you just said, I think, when we get to lengths and scores and things like that. Yeah, because I'm not really sure what the longest thing, because I, I don't really think there were many long compositions that Jeff had been on prior to this, you know, Machine Messiah comes to mind. Um, I'm having a hard time remembering if there's anything from the Buggles that was particularly long, but no. the Asia catalog is very, you know, a very radio friendly um, exactly. in terms of the length. So this definitely was a departure in terms of track lengths, even though each one of these has like little section names if to sort of differentiate the styles. Yeah, when you consider that, if you look at the Buggles music he did, look at drama, and look at what he did in Asia, this sounds like there's another Bill Bruford element where it gave him an opportunity to just brain dump stuff that he wasn't able to do in those arenas. That's what I hear. Yeah, uh, so uh, I guess that leads into this next question we always ask for these solo albums. How yes is it, in your opinion? Seven point three five eight percent, and <laughs> and I say that only because of some synth sounds, which still, having said that, were either very much of the time or a little forethought, you know, maybe ahead of themselves. But I don't, I don't hear like, oh, that's the mini moog sound that Rick used in and you and I, and oh, that's the poly moog that he uses in, uh, you know, whatever or or the 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 harpsichord clavinet and madrigal i just don't hear i it never even occurred to me that oh yeah he was in yes because i hear that it just i don't hear it and i i think that's good you know i'm saying that's good it's it's, it's got its own identity which i really like yeah I, I think i'm in a similar boat when listening to this i don't i'm not really reminded of yes so it's like maybe i don't know somewhere between one and five percent maybe even less than Bruford's album that we talked about recently somehow, yeah. but um, like I think there's at least a little bit of Asia and maybe GTR that one can hear, although I think those are a bit more obvious on the next album after this, Vox Humana, um, you know, that pop rock kind of right. feel in places, but yeah, this feels very different from Yes. Um, so possibly the most different from yes out of these solo albums so far. Um, so what do you think of the album cover? Oh, I love it, actually. And it's right there on our player. In fact, I'm going to look at it at a larger picture here where it won't cover the screen. Um, you know, you got uh, different um, pieces of things from musical notation. You've got the... There's a bass clef. There's no treble clef, which is interesting. You know, a few other things. It, in a way, it's a little lackluster considering, you know, the Asia covers and the Yes cover for drama. But we shouldn't make that comparison because this is his own thing. And I, I think in some ways it suits the music. It's not what I would have pictured if I didn't see the cover first. It's not what I would have pictured listening to the music. But I look at it and I go, oh, okay. What are your thoughts? Um, so I'm not, 
uh, I'm honestly not a huge fan of the cover because it, it doesn't really go with my tastes of like what I prefer from album covers. I uh, like I the do... other uh, release better, the re-release. Oh, the orangish one? Yeah, I'm going to put that one up. I like this a lot. Oh, I actually like that one less. Cause, oh. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's all up in flames as kind of like to me, it's kind of an eyesore. Um, oh, OK. But, but yeah, that's the 1996 re-release version. But uh, I was going to say, I do think that the original like black cover does kind of fit because I, I saw somewhere that um, this could be considered future jazz. And I don't know like how accurate that is, but looking at this cover and how the lettering is like, I do get a jazz feel from looking at it. You know what? Now that you point that out, I, I get that. I understand. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder what the significance is of those bars and the colors. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, it took me a while, like looking at the cover, like, um, you know, when I was listening to it, um, the, the album it took me a bit to realize oh the letters are supposed to say new dance orchestra because i was trying to figure out like what the heck is this supposed to be like i i see his name at the top well i did not even pick that bottom, up or... until you just mentioned it oh yeah it's, it's kind of not confusing even all cause, separate lines yeah yeah because the separate lines that divided words but yeah uh, but what do you think of the idea of him using that new dance orchestra name for this album. Uh, it eh, kind of indifferent. I mean, it's not, I don't, I don't. Okay. No offense, Jeff, birthday <laughs> boy, but it, to me, the name doesn't have the depth that the music does and the name doesn't resonate with me with the sound of the music. There's something incongruent to me between the name and what I hear in the music. New Dance Orchestra to me sounds much more like electronica dance music, but that's not mm -hmm. what this is. Yeah, I guess when looking at that name, I think more of the orchestra part than the dance part, in which case I do kind of see how this feel, this has like somewhat of a symphonic sound like you could imagine an orchestra like taking this and running oh, with yeah. it oh i would love to see this fashion. as a hollywood bowl with him in the middle and a big orchestra around him i would see that i love the music i think it, this is a really good album i was surprised that it just never i didn't know i didn't know yeah. i didn't know don't hate on me or my children hey wait a minute <laughs> the other children well you know what i mean yeah, I mean, Jeff even, uh, I think on his website, said that the record label didn't, like, do enough with it. So I guess it was kind of an obscure release. Um, but And if you look uh, at the albums that came out from his world at the time, like we talked about the Moody Blues, Emerson, Lick, and Powell, you know, that stuff, I could see how they might have thought, eh, well, we got to release it. It's Jeff freaking Downs, but... <laughs> you know, they probably didn't, you know, it wasn't going to tour. I don't know. I like it, though. I, I really, really like it. It ranks way up there for me. Yeah, it, it's got pretty good stuff on there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just... Any comments on the Drum Talk TV page or the Yes Shift page? Um, I do see a few comments on Drum Talk TV. Um, okay. Hey, everybody, I'm watching Drum Talk TV. Yeah, For those I of see. you who don't know, watching us on Yes Shift and don't know the whole Drum Talk TV thing, that's the largest online media company covering the world of drumming, and it's my company. I started it almost 10 years ago, January, but 10 years. So Steve and I thought, hey, let's cross post to that channel since people follow me there as well. So that's that's why. What did the Drum Talk TV fans say? Yeah, Is so it? a few a few of these are birthday wishes for Jeff. Right. Uh, Anyone I know? We have a million point two fans. I know probably a million point oh eight of them by name. <laughs> um, maybe uh, Angelina Christina sent some like Angelina. birthday cake emojis. Nice. Or, um, Thanks for watching. Or I don't know if emojis the right word, but you know it's a picture. Icon. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Abdrahim Flaga says, happy life for you, uh, you know, to Jeff. Thank you. Thank um, you. Kim Kevin Bingham mentioned Emerson Lake and Carl Palmer. Um, I guess when we were talking about E.L. Powell. Um, yeah. Ambroise uh, Zeta um, also put a couple icons. There's like a a present box, I think, and like two animals. Um, and two animals. <laughs> yeah, and a- nice. Emily V says, "I'm a Virgo too. Mine is the day after Jeff." Okay. Nice. Happy so birthday! Happy, yeah, happy early birthday to you. Yeah. Um, Thanks we, for chiming also, in, folks. How about on the Yes Shift page? Anybody there? Um, I don't see comments on the Yes Shift page, even though it shows that people are watching. But okay, I I did collect comments uh, from when I shared the album cover around and was asking yeah those don't count we're not doing that so (laughs) let's talk about no i'm kidding let's take turns going through that okay so uh graham allen says have this on vinyl love this release wow i wonder what that sounds like on vinyl i wonder if it graham if you're watching or if you end up seeing this chime in in the comments even afterwards i'd love to know if on vinyl i'm guessing it's less pristine so I wonder if it has that nice, warmer, fatter analog sound to it, and which one do you favor if you were to listen to it on YouTube or if you have the disc as well? I'd be really curious to know. Right. Oh, and then Miguel Angel Esquivel says, great disc, incredible work. Cool. You guys should get together and compare vinyl versus disc. <laughs> And Marcus Olander says, once in a while, I give it a spin. And on Thursday, I will absolutely listen to it again on his 70th birthday. Me too. Absolutely. Scott, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, Scott. Jabel, I think, uh, with a G. It's a phenomenal CD. I haven't listened to it much in the last five years, but it used to be in regular circulation. I'm loving that. I never heard of it, and there's a lot of people loving it, and I love it. I love that. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I think most of these responses were in the Asia groups I shared into, but there were a couple in a uh, couple yes groups at least. Um, Robert Ragusa says my biggest mistake was not holding on to my album version and not purchasing the CD when I came across it in a used record store. Interesting. So you don't have either now. You're stuck with the youtube version so robert i'm curious what happened to your album did you throw it away did you trade it for (laughs) weed like what's the story there's a story there what's the story i mean it could have been just lost in a move simple as that oh i've lost some stuff and i'll never forget the move where i lost probably this thick worth of albums Oh, my. Yeah. But I have most of my favorites in the most important. I don't even remember what was lost, but ugh, sore spot. Right. Okay. Um, then we've got, uh, where did we leave off? Sorry. Oh, Robert, Robert Tracy. Tracy. Yeah. It says, try listening to it at night with all the lights off. It's pretty cool. Ooh. Any other um, complimentary elements you'd recommend with that? I'm just curious. Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, th- this does feel like a nighttime album to me, so I I totally feel that. You know, um, what about? Oh, hello, I, I'm gonna uh, listen to it like this. In fact, oh, uh, w- with like the lights uh, dimmed type of thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ro- Robert Griffin says ahead of its time, and Jacobo Conte says great album. I like Robert Griffin's comment. I agree. I've, you know, that's hard to think about unless you really put yourself in that context or you heard it then when it came out. Now that I heard you say Robert's comment and I'm looking at it, I agree. I think it was ahead of its time. Rick Wakeman's stuff up to that point sounded in time. You know what I mean? It, it, right. Because he was always ahead of his time, but it sounded like Rick being rick at that time so that that's really a very fair compliment i like that yeah uh so yeah i i just read jacobo's comment okay michael scott miller says i had it on what's a cassette or cassette (laughs) what is that 
I had it on cassette, cassette years ago. Tape. I was into new age music and I had a gift certificate that I wanted to cash and use for something else, probably beer at that age. I think it was <laughs> 50 cents on clearance. You know what that reminds me of? There are some elements in there and I think it's East West that reminds me of Kitaro. And especially oh, yeah? the Kitaro album that John Anderson was on. Yeah, I hear reflections of that. I'm curious if anyone else, like Michael, who was into new age music at the time, as was I, um, kind of got that same feeling. I loved that Kitaro album. I have that on cassette somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and uh, David McGowan says, have it on LP when it first came out years ago. Wow. Cool. Yeah, if you that's... still have it, I'd ask the same question. Is it fatter, warmer, like analog is supposed to be? And Donovan Gustafsson says, absolutely wonderful music. This recording is a master class in arranging and layering of sounds. Pure genius. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. And then um, a Gary Van Leeuwen says he is so prolific. And that I love that comment as well because if we go back to the earlier part of the conversation and what right. Van Carl was saying – you look at the body of work with, well, the one album, Drama, the, you know, there's that, which is a body of work, but then all the stuff with Asia and then with John Wetton, all of that is very prolific. And then this, this whole different brain dump of a thing, I'm finally going to let this cat out of the bag. Um, that That's a really great point. Well, yeah, cool. definitely. So you want um, to move on to, or do you have final words for it? Do you want to move on to uh, synthesizer um, class? Yeah, I, I do have uh, final thoughts just real quick. Um, I, I do see a comment from Dave Motes saying the drama tour was actually a pretty good one. And yeah, and in terms of live play, um, uh, you know, I, I already told you this, but I, I had a hard time finding whether he Jeff has played any of this live. So I don't know if he's ever played maybe excerpts as like a keyboard solo in an Asia concert or something. So I'm kind of surprised all the years since this came out, we knowingly don't have never heard him do it. There's so much great material here. Why not put that into your solo in a, you know what I mean? <laughs> like what? Right. Well, if it has happened, maybe it's just because we like weren't really buried and just, yeah, yeah, it's really obscure stuff. Yeah. But yeah, this was an interesting first album from him, definitely. Like not what we'd expect. But if you'll recall, like last year for his birthday episode, we were kind of surprised some of the different things he did, which we'll kind of touch on uh, in a bit. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the light program. And uh, in related Jeff Downs news, like we mentioned earlier, uh, Cleopatra Records recently released Synthesizer Classics over on August 12th, um, which, funny enough, was the same day that apparently Rick Wakeman appeared on BBC's Proms. Um, so, yeah, and um, apparently he's got a couple other things coming up this month. Like he said on the 27th, he'll be attending the Piano Tuners Annual Conference at the Granary, where he'll hopefully get to play the world's largest grand piano made by Chalum in the 1930s. Wow. Um, and the, on the world's 20... largest? Yeah, apparently. And huh. he says on the, on the 29th, uh, Rick is also going to be giving a talk slash lecture in Oxford uh, University. Um, so... Yeah, that should be interesting. I'm curious to hear like if anyone goes and like what that's like. But so wait, I, I'm sorry, I missed something. Is it Jeff or Rick who's playing the largest grand piano? Rick. If it's so big, why can't they play it together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, synthesizer classics. Um, I'll just read the description for it real quick. The modern day wizards and veteran knights of the keyboard reinvent several classic tracks that laid the foundation of electronic music and influenced thousands of synthsational artists and players. I like the wordplay there. Features performances by such heralded pros as Yes's Rick Wakeman, Asia's Jeff Downs, and Larry Fast alongside the next generation 
including Dream Theater's Derek Sherinian and Jordan Rudess. Classic compositions by Kraftwerk, Mike Oldfield, jean michel Jarre, I hope I pronounced that correctly, John Carpenter, and more. Um, so, yeah, this has eight tracks, uh, which are Tubular Bells, Magic Fly, Polestar, Chase, Oxygen Part 4, Escape from New York, Tour de France, and Visitors. Uh, so the ones featuring Yes members are Magic Fly, which has Rick, Polestar, which has Jeff, and Oxygen, which has Patrick. So, yeah, what do you think of well, all this? Dad? At the beginning of the show, I mentioned I had two things to say about it. One that would blow your mind. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> and also probably I'm cause ready. an uproar with a lot of people. And the other thing is uh, a bit of a criticism about the album, and I'll start with that. It's like okay. I was really surprised that, um, like, let me remind myself. Uh, oh, it's over here. Sorry, wrong computer. Because this is in regard to the order. I was surprised that um, you, you got Rick Wakeman, Jeff Downs, Jordan Rudis, and Patrick Moraz in that order. Why? Why? Nothing against Jordan. Why couldn't you put the three yes guys right in a row? Like, what the <laughs> fuck is up with that? Seriously, you were that close to having a thing where people could say, oh my God, there's three yes keyboard players and they're all in a row. No, can't do it. Can't say it because it didn't happen. I don't get that, how how they missed that. Maybe the person doing the order didn't know who they were or I don't know. That that really kind of irked me, as you could tell. <laughs> so here's I mean, another. That, that's, that's hilarious to me because I was fine with the tracking order. Of course. Just... <laughs> you know, just looking at the names, the first two in a row, and then I'm like, okay, Jordan Rudis, but I thought, oh, he's the next one. Okay, wait a minute. Why aren't they all three in a row? Okay, <laughs> now. To the music, this might blow your mind. And I want you, if, if you didn't think of this as well, what I'd like you to do is take each of those three Yes Men's tracks on here and just right. randomly go to anywhere in any track and listen to 10 or 15 seconds and see if this rings a bell with you. I think that any of those three tracks could have been on the Jeff Downs album we just reviewed. I think that the oh, sound, wow. yeah, I think the soundscapes are so similar and, and all of that that it, they don't sound that dissimilar if you look at it like that. And they could have been on that album. Uh, yeah, that's interesting because with Magic Fly, um, I, I listened to the original for comparison, but on, on Magic Fly, you can really hear Rick injecting his keyboard personality you know the really fancy stuff the like doo -doo 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 -doo, you know and, and i know um, based and even on like, what you just and said even like circus music at the end of the track that wasn't on the original as far as i can tell which was yeah pretty funny. And, and i have to say based on what you just said i know that some of what i'm saying may sound like an overstatement and people are freaking out. Oh my God, you can't say that. Rick Wakeman sounds like he should have been on Jeff Downs. You know, yes isn't yes without Tom <laughs> Brislin. You know I mean? It's like, you know what I mean? I know there's people out there doing that and their jowls shaking. I, I, just sections just sound, so that circles back to the question, how do I think Jeff Bingham, yes, influenced this album? I don't think much at all, but I do hear now how Patrick's playing and Rick's playing influenced Jeff when you listen oh. to those three tracks. Okay. Yeah, the one that Patrick is on, um, oh, I guess it's pronounced Oxygen, probably. I, I missed that E after the end. But um, in, the, in the track Patrick's on, it, I think of a tropical island, and that seems somehow fitting for him to be on that type of track. Um, and the one that Jeff Downs did, Polestar, that's actually originally a Vangelis track. And what's funny about that to me is, um, and I know we said we'd like try to refrain from mentioning 
this, uh, but I feel like it's relevant here. Um, Polestar was, you know, a short it, sample it, there. <laughs> yeah, Polestar is so recognizable. Like once you hear it, but um, a a year or so after that song came out, after Van Gelis put that song out, Francis Monkman did that album that we've talked about energism and it has a song called the achievements of man which sounds pretty similar to pole star so i don't know if like the library music company told him hey do something that sounds like this type of thing that's but, interesting yeah. and, and like now having jeff do the vangelis uh song it's it's like really um it, yeah that's a weird comes, triad of circumstances yeah it's like a weird triangle type of thing yeah <laughs> um, maybe they're all the same guy yeah, maybe all the keyboardists on Synthesizer Classics are the same, but um, but no. Um, it's funny, when I heard the title and read it the first time, it, it's not at all what I thought. I thought it was going to be like you'd hear uh, part two of Carnival 9, First Impression, and you'd hear Roundabout, and you'd... Oh, you like know, more recognizable Yeah, yeah maybe stuff. not Roundabout, because that's... Right. But yeah, that's what I thought Synthesizer Classics would be the original versions of some classic songs that featured synth sounds that are classic synth. That's what I expected, and then I'm looking through it, going, wait a minute, this isn't a... What's wrong with me? Like, what is wrong <laughs> with me? This is why Angela is constantly threatening to just ship me off to your sister, Samantha. Wow. Um, but to be fair, like some of these tracks do feel obscure to me and, yeah. uh, to beer bells, I'm pretty sure I've listened to, you know, the Mike Oldfield version, yeah. um, the, and escape from New York, of course, the John Carpenter film, which I'm honestly not a huge fan of, um, the last couple of tracks on here, uh, particularly tour de France and visitors sound very eighties. Yeah. to me like they did such a a great job emulating that 80s feel it's weird know? that jeff isn't one of those yeah if you think about weird. it you know yeah because pull star i think is from the 70s but it doesn't like it feels like it could be from any era i guess yeah so i don't know um it's a good album though it's cool it's a neat thing to have yeah definitely um uh, and you know cleopatra records loves doing these types of things. So looking forward to seeing what else they do yeah, with are, like various proggy guests. Uh, absolutely. Are you going to drop the Bandcamp link? Oh yeah, good idea. Um, yeah. And good. Did, did, and yeah, uh, and did you show the album cover for yes. people watching? I'll, this? I'll pull it up again for those just joining us or who missed it. Okay. And, um. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. The cover is based on you know that's an homage to. Uh, Robert Moog and Keith Moon, because Keith, Keith Moon, Keith Emerson, sorry. Mo, <laughs> yeah, Moon, so many Moog, Keiths. Mug, Richards. Mags, yeah. Um, because, <laughs> Keith Richards. because the giant wall of, of oscillators and knobs and all that was something, you know, created for Keith specifically and with Keith and all of that. And he's the only one that, that really had something like that. Uh, but yet it made the cover and he's not on it. So I, I love that they're giving, you know, paying that homage to both of them. Uh, Robert, Bob Moog, really the, the synth, this album would not exist without Bob Moog. Yes Music would not sound like Yes Music without Bob Moog. Rick Wakeman might have become a dentist without <laughs> Bob Moog. I mean, that the sound, it's as much, if not more, of the sound of keyboards as the Les Paul is by Les Paul uh, in the guitar world. It's just so, he was the guy. It's like, you know what it's like? Sorry, I have to say this. It's, I go on for a moment. It's like inventing a color. There'd be no purple without this lady or that guy that invented purple. It's that much of so far away from anything else it's other than the theremin rod that was used in uh, the old science fiction movies back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, the synthesizer replaced that, in essence, the single note monophonic, you know. Sorry, I went off on that tangent, but I think this, this is a great album. and They could come out with multiple volumes and never run out of artists or material yeah, and reimagine sure. stuff, which is cool. Yeah, and I do love this cover. It looks really yeah. slick, really great. Yeah. 
Um, and this next item, uh, also Jeff Downs related. So uh, another uh, collaboration he's part of is the Downs Braid Association. So, you know, his music project has been doing with Chris Braid and their upcoming fifth album, Celestial Songs, I believe is slated for October or November now. Right around the um, corners, we're recording this. Yeah, and uh, over on Twitter a, a week ago, like seven days ago, they said uh, they were working on two music videos for the upcoming album. Oh, so. that's cool. Where the hell are those going to be? MTV doesn't play <laughs> music videos anymore. Yeah, no, it, it'll probably be on YouTube, you, like like has yeah. been done with other things. Like I saw that um, there was another Steve Howe and Virgil Howe uh, video from Lunar Mist put up oh. today. Yeah, and we're covering that soon, right? Uh, yeah, we'll be covering Nexus on the 23rd. And then I think after we get Lunar Miss, we'll review that. Because I, I know that comes out on the same day, but we might have to wait until, like, we're able to, like, listen to it and fully... Yeah, we'll figure it out, but... Yeah, and... Yeah. So it's about a month away or uh, so. Right, we're doing a... Here's what I'm stuck on. On the 30th of this month, as we're recording this in August, we're doing another Roger Dean special. The birthday special we did last year, I think we should just replay that and change it. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because it's the most visual, duh, of all the episodes we did. It's a huge body of work that we compiled and edited together. We asked fans about favorite covers. It goes way beyond yes. I don't, what the hell are we going to do? Like, how are we going to top that? Oh, uh, yeah, we kind of talk, talked about it a little bit. but And, yeah, I will reshare that on his actual birthday on our Facebook page but uh, and on YouTube as well because I don't think it's on YouTube yet. But, uh, yeah, I was um, thinking that this time around what you and I could do is we Don't could go through. <laughs> I have an idea, too. Let's talk about it offline. Uh, okay. All right. All right. We'll do that. <laughs> and then, uh, on a side note related or not, or related or not, Steve and I are working on something to do together in person. We live a few hundred miles away. I'm in the mountains, a hundred miles east of Phoenix. He's in Bakersfield, California. We're working on something that if it happens, we're going to do our first show together, uh, which will be cool. So we'll let you right. know about that. Um, and then we've also got... Some other episodes scheduled, but we don't know exactly what we're doing yet. And oh, we've got yeah, some. I, yeah, I think I have an idea, but we'll okay. have to like explain we, yeah. on one of them at least. To and you. we got but, some fan suggestions sitting that we can get to. Um, and you're welcome to give us suggestions at yesshiftpodcast at gmail.com. Um, and if you're listening to us on anchor.fm, watch us on facebook at facebook.com slash yes shift and if you're only familiar with this version where you, you see us and you don't want to see us or at least you don't want to see me go ahead over to anchor.fm slash yes shift if you're a podcasty and you like listening while you're running or whatever yeah for sure so yeah you can tune in uh when we're live again on tuesday the 30th at 5 30 p.m Pacific. roger dean's birthday episode yeah. And yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. Um, and again, you know, find us on all those places and YouTube where I'm uploading stuff. Um, so yeah, thanks again. And always great to hear people's opinions on all this stuff. Yeah. Thanks for the comments. And we've got some other uh, email things that we'll get to on another episode, possibly right. a news desk report. Uh, this is episode 60, Steve. Can you believe that? Episode 60, right. we recently celebrated a year. We've got 60 what we call episodes, and there's two about two dozen news desk reports. Yeah, um, so there's like a lot a of stuff. a couple bonus things, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've done a lot. Yeah, dive in, folks. We've had interviews with Bill Bruford, Mike Tiano, Oliver Wakeman. Mike Tiano's coming back again in September from Notes from the Edge fame. Um, right. I know I'm forgetting some... Um, uh, from Low Bait Scarp, we've had Adam, oh, Adam Sears. Sears. Yeah, we're yeah. we're gonna have Bob Dave Seska. Brisner. We're gonna have Tom Brislin. We're gonna have some other folks. Yeah, uh, we're, we're good. We're gonna try to. Yeah, yeah, it's just a matter of timing. Oh, they'll do it. They'll do it. <laughs> yeah, we we've reached out to a few other people too. 
um, Steve Hackett. We had Steve freaking Hackett on a couple of weeks ago. That was a thrill yeah. for me. I mean, a huge, huge Steve Hackett fan from his Genesis years and the Genesis Revisited stuff. Um, we had yeah. uh, and Craig, his drummer uh, Craig, Craig Blundell was really he was too. awesome. Yeah. yeah, simulcasted that on Jump Talk TV and the S Shift as well. So hey, dive in and see what's there. You might be surprised. Couple knuckleheads doing a vlog podcast. Yes. But we've had some really cool guests and great material we've covered. Yeah, definitely. Okay, okay one knucklehead. <laughs> Not you. Thanks, everybody, so much yeah. for following what we do. If you're watching the archive, go ahead and comment. We we track back and address everything. We don't leave any stone unturned. Right, yeah. Oh, let's uh, go out with a little bit of music. Here we go with a little more Jeff as we say goodbye with a bit of East West. Thanks so much for following what we do. And remember, you can write us at yesshiftpodcast at gmail.com. Listen to us at anchor.fm slash yesshift. And you can watch us do our thing at facebook.com slash yesshift. Thanks, folks. 